Okay, I think we're going to get started. So you're all very welcome um, to this latest Softbox Labs webinar uh, titled More Fluency in Less Time. My name is Martin Farrows, and with me uh, we have my colleagues, Amelia Kelly, our VP of Speech Technology, and Brenda McGurk, Head of Education Product at Softbox. And we also have Shelley Gramajo, uh, who's Senior Product Manager at Imagine learning. So just while we're waiting for everybody uh, to join, uh, feel free to introduce yourselves on the chat um, today. But please, if you want to ask a question, and we will be taking questions at various intervals throughout this webinar, please use the Q&A function on Zoom, just because it's very hard to track questions in the chat. So chat is for the informal chatty stuff, and the Q&A is for the questions. Um, so in terms of the running order today, uh, Shelley has agreed to share with us what Imagine Learning have um, have learned from their experience with working with Soapbox, in particular around their oral reading fluency uh, tool called Fluent Reader Plus. She's going to share some insights and some, some statistics around a pilot uh, that they ran specifically. Um, and then after Shelley's talk, we're going to dive into a demo from Amelia and Brenda, who will be showing you the Soapbox fluency tool. Um, if you don't get your question answered, then you can email us at hello at soapboxlabs.com. Uh, there's also a link on our website for a Soapbox fluency product sheet, which we'll probably place into the chat as well. We'll put that link in there. Um, and there'll be a, a case study document that you'll be able to, um, to look at as well. So just before we kick off and before I hand over to Shelley, just to give you a very quick introduction uh, to Soapbox Labs. So those of you who don't know us, we, we build speech recognition for kids. We power tools and platforms for language learning, for oral, oral reading fluency, for dyslexia screening, uh, maths and science and more. But today, we're actually going to be focused on our Soapbox Fluency product and the one that powers oral reading assessments. We have over 50 clients globally who are using this product. And um, the feedback, uh, uh, unanimous feedback, is just how accurate that platform is um, and, and has been robustly tested with, with kids from um, all backgrounds and accents and dialects. Um, so it's an, it's like an, it's an agnostic um, voice engine and um, we provide you with the data um, in order that you can build amazing experiences uh, for kids and feedback loops for, for teachers and, and educators. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Shelley, who's going to run you through uh, Imagine Learning's experience with working with that tool. Actually, Sorry to interrupt, Martin. Somebody is messaging to say that uh, the chat is disabled, if, if that could be um, enabled. Okay. Sorry, Shelley. No worries. All right, let me share the screen. Are y'all seeing the right screen? Yes, yes. perfect. Okay. Thank you. Hi, all. I'm so glad to be here this morning to talk about fluency and Fluent Reader Plus. Um, as Martin said, I'm Shelly Gramajo, Senior Product Manager for the Imagine Literacy Suite team. Uh, today, we are going to do a little bit of introductions, uh, give you an overview of what Fluent Reader is, what how Fluent Reader Plus is different, give you a little bit of a sneak peek into our educator experience and talk about the results of our pilot. If you're not familiar with us, we are Imagine Learning, built by educators for educators. Imagine Learning is the sum total of 23 years, 4 million students, and 20,000 American schools across 25 of the nation's largest school districts, dedicated to embracing the unique learning journey of the individual. Imagine Learning has a broad and diverse portfolio covering core curriculum, courseware, instructional services, and supplemental programs. Imagine Language and Literacy sits within our supplemental and intervention suite. Language and Literacy is adaptive. Every student's experience will be unique as they explore and practice targeted skills, accelerating to match a cognitive leap or adjusting to accommodate unfinished learning. In addition, language and literacy targets all four domains of literacy, writing, listening, speaking, and of course, reading, which is where Fluent Reader and Fluent Reader Plus come in. Starting as early as first grade, students may begin to encounter the Fluent Reader activity as part of their personalized learning pathway. During Fluent Reader, students complete a one minute timed read that is recorded and stored in the student's digital portfolio alongside other recordings and writing samples. 
So how is Fluent Reader Plus different? So Fluent Reader Plus is for educators. Students are not gonna notice a change in their experience. It's a tool built on an integration with Soapbox Fluency that automatically evaluates those Fluent Reader audio files and allows us to provide data for words correct per minute and accuracy in Fluent Reader activity. And educators with Fluent Reader Plus will see oral reading fluency metrics in the student portfolio summary and the portfolio artifact detail pages. But why did we do this at all? So let's take a step back and level set for just a minute. Non-fluent readers must focus attention on decoding, meaning less attention is available for understanding the meaning of the text. Measuring reading fluency helps a teacher identify if students are decoding both accurately and automatically. Students who score below expectations on oral reading fluency measures can be identified and then provided with targeted support. Okay, so but why automate it? All right, welcome to my Montessori classroom. You are looking at 2011. It's my daughter's nine-year-old birthday and we're doing her walk around the sun. That's the traditional Montessori birthday celebration. She's in third grade. I've been teaching school for, I can't even remember how long at this point. Before I transitioned to ed tech, I spent 10 years in the classroom teaching first, second, and third graders. That's called lower elementary in Montessori. So I taught these first, second, and third graders, among other things, how to read. I would spend hours at beginning, middle, and end of year evaluating oral reading fluency for all my students. After I did the evaluation three times a year, I would spend anywhere from 30 to 60 week, minutes every week sitting with those students of mine who were below or well below proficiency levels to ensure that they were making progress, that they were learning. Anyone with experience in elementary education will tell you that evaluating and monitoring oral reading fluency is one of the most important things that they do. But man, is it time intensive. I was fortunate, I had an assistant in my classroom, so I could go out in the hall, sit with these students one-on-one -on -one while my assistant did other things with the students in the classroom, but not everybody has that luxury. And if you don't have time to sit down with those students, you may have, five or six, seven or eight students who are below or well below level, and you have to spend time with them every single week. The gold standard of education technology is giving teachers back time for the learning activities that only an, a teacher in the classroom can deliver. So oral, automating oral reading fluency measures seemed like a no-brainer. So how does it work? So the student completes the fluent reader activity, which generates the audio file. We send it to Soapbox Labs, along with its associated text file. They run it through their powerful Soapbox Fluency engine and send us back metrics. We do the calculations. And there is a lot of data that they send back. Some of the data that comes back includes words read, words count, deletion count, substitution count, insertion count, audio duration, Etc. There's a lot more. They're going to tell you all about this when I'm when I'm done here. But they're sending us back all of this data, and the value here is that we, as the customer, have the flexibility to decide how to use this data. So, for example, you may choose to define mistakes as the number of deleted words plus the number of substituted words in the audio file, ignoring the number of inserted words, or you could include that value in the calculation. The decision is up to you to decide how you define mistakes. And you may choose to define mistakes differently depending on the type of evaluation you are doing. So by not prescribing how the data is used, Soapbox Labs empowers their customers to implement their own unique solutions. And then everything happens very quickly. The Soapbox Fluency returns the data in milliseconds. It's near instantaneous. And the calculations on our end happen immediately. The part that might take a minute is the uploading of the data on the page. Educators are gonna see those Fluent Reader Plus metrics within five to 10 minutes. 
Okay, so let's turn our attention to the educator experience. Educators in organizations enrolled in Fluent Reader Plus will see the oral reading fluency metrics in two places. The first is here. This is our student summary page. This is a page that includes all of the artifacts generated by an individual student. You'll notice that this one here at the top, beginning books, it doesn't have words correct per minute or accuracy. That's a decision we made on our part to not evaluate those particular audio files because they're not measuring fluency. We've chosen to focus all of our attention for oral reading fluency on our fluency activity. This is by design. The other place educators are gonna see this data is on the individual artifact page. So going from this page here, we're gonna click on one of those artifacts and we're gonna to go to this page here. This includes all of the information about this particular artifact that was generated by the student. So we're gonna have the words correct per minute and accuracy here. Now, educators with organizations not in Fluent Reader Plus are spending a lot of time at this level in the portfolio. Because without Fluent Reader Plus, the teacher is gonna need to click here to download the text in order to listen to the audio while completing a running record. So when you are, on, when you are evaluating oral reading fluency, you are listening to the child read, and you are making marks on a document as they read. You're marking, they got this word wrong, they inserted a word here, and you're marking this running record. You're gonna be spending at least, this audio file is 55 seconds long, you're gonna be spending at least that long, probably about twice as long um, with every audio file, with every read, okay? Students can complete multiple fluent reader activities in a week. This activity is repeated regularly within the student sequence, so you could have a single student with two or three new artifacts each week. And if you've got 20, 25, 30 kids in your class and they're all encountering Fluent Reader, we're talking a lot of time spent on this page. So with Fluent Reader Plus, all the teacher has to do is come in here and award some in-game currency or mark the audio file as review. So what was once a very lengthy process now takes just a few seconds. And our pilot users seemed to bear this out. So following our initial integration with Soapbox Fluency, we recruited partners in schools and districts across nine states to allow us to enable Fluent Reader Plus for their accounts. So without any effort on their part, teachers began to see oral reading fluency metrics automatically displayed in their student portfolios and we saw a significant change in user behavior. So we're gonna do a little bit of like audience participation now, I've been talking a lot. Uh, I would like you all to go to the chat and answer me this. On average, how much time do the educators in our pilot group spend using our portfolio tools as compared to the control? Okay, do you think that was twice as much time, five times as much time, 10 times as much time or no change. I'm gonna let you take a minute here to, to do the chat, throw your answers in there. Maybe nobody wants to play today. There we go, thank you. I'm so glad. I'm like, am I, am I you not hearing me? Okay, five, 10, 10, five, all right. No change, All right, okay. So the question is, how much time do the educators in the pilot group spend using the portfolio tools, all of the tools as compared to our control, okay? Click, go, it's not going. Why is it not going? Uh, hang on a second. We're not moving forward here with my PowerPoint. Mm, there we go. Okay, twice as much. So overall, the portfolio tools increased among our pilot user group with the group on average clocking twice as much time as the control group, okay? That's the first part. Second part, 
on average, again, how much do the educators in the pilot group view the portfolio artifact detail pages as compared to the control? So remember that's this page. This is where the teachers do the work of evaluating the artifacts and providing feedback. So how often do educators in this pilot group view these pages as compared to the control? If I didn't make it clear, the control is everybody not in our pilot group. Is that, again, twice as often, 10 times, five times as often, 10 times as often, or no change? Okay, watching the chat here. Five, two, two. Okay. All right. So we got a lot more people this time who think that there was going to be no change. So, no. While overall time in the portfolio doubled, pilot users were going to this artifact detail page 10 times more often than their peers. Last question, you ready? How much time on average did educators in that pilot group spend viewing each artifact as compared to the control? So every time they went to that portfolio page, how much time did they stay there compared to the group that was the control? Was that, so you're gonna be uh, answering, is was it more or less time, right? And you're gonna say, is it 16%? more or less, 32% or 64%. This one's like a complicated way to word this, so sorry about that. 64% less, 64% less, 16% more, okay. Some people who are pretty optimistic about this, some people who are pretty pessimistic about this. All right. Okay, well, here we go. Survey says 64% less time. So they spent more time overall. They viewed those artifacts more frequently, but they spent a fraction of the time on each view. So while educators in our control group, everybody not enrolled in the pilot, spent an average of 120 minutes over 180 days viewing portfolio artifacts, educators in the pilot group spent only approximately 40 minutes on average. So the amount of time that educators spent here was astonishing. This suggests that educators using Fluent Reader Plus have enough confidence in our data to take our word for it. Instead of clicking into an artifact, downloading the PDF, listening to the audio, awarding the booster bits, teachers are noting the metrics, making a selection, and moving on in a matter of seconds. The amount of time saved here is astounding. So what's next for Fluent Reader Plus? Fluent Reader Plus was announced for Back to School in 22. It's available as an opt-in feature to all Imagine Language and Literacy customers. Over the last 30 days, we've seen usage among opted in customers grow, which will allow us to continue monitoring and analyzing user behavior as we determine what is next for Imagine Learning and Soapbox Labs. We're thrilled to have partnered with Soapbox Labs and look forward to a long and productive relationship. That's it. So I'll go ahead and open it up for any questions. Thanks, Shelley. Um, so we might just get you to stop sharing just now, and then we'll get, get you back on the big yeah. screen so that we can see. Yeah, no worries. Better. There we go. Um, and uh, we do have one question in the Q&A, so let's just take that one first. So uh, this is from, I think that's Malone Dun Dunlavy. Dun um, you mentioned in-game currency. What kind of game environment do the kids have, and how do they use that currency? Good question. So Imagine Language and Literacy is a gamified learning environment that's built on the Unity 3D game engine. So there are lots of like it, it's a uh, it's not as a as a gamified built environment. It has opportunities for things like 3D interactions with characters and there's 
just lots of really playful elements. It's also very media rich. We have lots of beautiful animations, lots of beautiful videos. We have peer voiced audio for the children. And then the in-game currency, we call it booster bits. So one of our one of our mascots is a little robot. His name is Booster. He helps the students along with their learning journey. And booster bits are uh, is currency that students can earn in order, you know, when they perform well within the game, they can get gold or silver or red, yellow or green, and then they can use that. We have a there's a, a section of the game called the Imagine Museum where they can go in and they can play little micro games, um, and they can use their currency to buy things for their avatar clothing and hairstyles and stuff like that. Okay, very cool. And um, and a second question from Porig Monaghan. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. It's two questions. First of all, is the pilot study published or is it going to be published? And secondly, is there any evidence on how children's reading has progressed, how feedback on children needing extra reading support was taken into account by educators? Yeah, two very good questions. So the pilot study was um, more of a product focused pilot. Um, from our side to determine whether or not we wanted to move forward with the integration. So a further study into the actual adoption and efficacy and measuring outcomes and all of that would come later. We may be looking into doing something like that in the coming school year, not this year. We haven't got anything in place for this year, but in the future, I would expect that we would would run some sort of study like that with a partnering organization within the United States and then have published results. So this is, this wasn't that kind of study. Great, okay. And uh, another question from Sophie. Um, thanks for the presentation. I might have missed it in the beginning, but where are the texts coming from that the children are reading? Um, is it any text that the teacher selects um, or, or are they kind of pre-selected? Um, and is it possible to differentiate reading mistakes for regularly written words and irregularly written words? Yeah, good question. So the texts come from our our sequence, right? Our our sequence of activities. Some of the activities, some of the texts that students are going to encounter would be part of what we would call a warm read. So they come from a book. They're an excerpt from a book that a student has interacted with before they do the reading. It is determined by our smart sequencer to be the appropriate level for the student. And they would encounter it after being primed with vocabulary instruction and having the book read to them and having a chance to read the book. So there's a lot of reloading that goes into those. We have another type of text that is a cold read that a teacher can assign. So teachers can choose which texts they want to give to the students. Now, as far as differentiating between the types of mistakes a student might be making, we're not doing that right now, but that is something that is a possible like next step. Um, and Brenda will be telling you about that when she you're doing the demo, right? When they When they walk you through how the engine works, uh, you're going to get more insight to what else is possible. Okay, great. Well, look, I think at that point, then um, we'll move things along. There will be other opportunities to ask questions a little bit later. Um, but for now, thank you, Shelley, for that presentation. And Shelley's going to stick around. Um, and Amelia is now going to pick up uh, the conversation and give a demonstration of some of the uh, features of the Soapbox Fluency Server. So over to you, Amelia, and I will just change the layout here so that you have the screen. Great. Thanks, Martin. And thank you, Shelley, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I think it's just really, really exciting to see some of the technology that we've been building here over the last eight years or more go into uh, a product get out there in the world being used by educators and by students. It's exactly what we wanted to happen and uh, to see it actually happening and to get these metrics back about um, how teachers' behaviours have changed and they're shifting away from the rote admin work of running records and being targeted towards where they can actually do most good as teachers. That's just really, really exciting. Um, at Soapbox, you know, we're immersed in the technology all the time and you know, we all really, really believe that 
it's uh, really important to get speech recognition into the fabric of some of these educational products and really accelerate the learning potential of all the students just to try and mitigate the literacy crisis, trying to overturn some of the the setbacks that we've experienced over COVID, we just think it's it's really, really important. And, and to see, see your presentation there has been really inspiring. So thanks for that. And um, I guess I'll introduce myself after, uh, eventually I'll get to it. I'm Amelia Kelly. I'm the VP of Speech Technology here at Soapbox. And um, I've worked in speech for about 15 years now. I, um, I, I am a Fulbright Scholar. I have a PhD and a master's in speech technology and linguistics from Trinity College in Dublin. And um, I lead a team of engineers, uh, linguists and scientists here at Soapbox. And we together we build um, the most accurate uh, child speech recognition technology. And again, for the purposes of education, gaming and any kind of voice experiences where it's really important to have safe, accurate and bias free uh, speech technology for kids speech. And uh, joining me today to um, show you a demo of some of our technology is our head of um, education product, uh, Brenda McGurk, who is really, really knowledgeable um, about all the applications of speech technology in education. Um, she is um, heads up the, um, the education product team and um, really works with all our, our engineers, all our scientists and linguists in getting all that technical stuff into the product, getting it working for clients and liaising with clients to see how it's going to be used in their technology and their product as well. So um, will I will I jump right into a demo? Yeah, OK, let's go. So what I'm going to show you here is really the underlying technology that uh, that uh, Shelley was showcasing the kind of wraparound, the, the UX, the uh, product and platform that the voice gets uh, integrated with. But what I'm going to show you is the actual voice technology itself. Um, my uh, one thing I should say, though, is that um, as Soapbox is a B2B company, um, we uh, don't have a working product like um the Imagine Learning product that, that Shelley showed. What I have here is just a, a demo. It's a mock-up of what an education product could look like. And it's solely for the purposes of showing what um, how our fluency product works and how we walk through it. So what I'm going to show you here is um, a text right in the middle of the screen here. Um, you see a text that the child is going to read. Under the hood here is our live product, the Soapbox Engine. So the Soapbox um, engine, Soapbox Fluency in particular, is going to take an incoming audio file of a child reading this passage. And then it's a very powerful engine, as Shelley said as well. And um, it will take in the audio file and not only will it generate a transcript of what the child said, but it does further analysis in that it compares what the child was reading to this particular text. And then we surface data points relevant and pertinent to this um, reading attempt. So um, I'm just going to play this file and you can hear what I'm talking about. Fonzie, Yet, and Yog. Yet and Yog are flying in space. What is that near a rocket? Shouts Fonzie. It looks like a space rock. That is an asteroid, says Yog. Look, millions of our asteroids. Oh no, we are in an asteroid belt. An asteroid, an asteroid could break the rocket. Fonzi has to have has. Too quickly, zig, zig, and zag. Fonzie goes left. So, um, I think this is a very representative speech file. Um, I think also you can imagine what it must be like to sit down and listen to many, 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 many of these. And just for assessment, that is, that's tough. But imagine if you were encouraging the child to practice and listening to every one of them as well. 
um, that would take an awful long time. And doing the running records involves looking at these and adding some markup. Um, saying if each word was correct, whether it was a substitution, whether the child omitted a word, whether they inserted a word that wasn't there, uh, then, you know, there are child behaviours as well, like repetition and self-corrections that maybe um, Brenda and my, uh, might talk about later. But first, I'm going to show you how the Soapbox engine does that running record analysis um, automatically. So here you can see the markup according to this results legend of exactly what the child read in relation to what they were supposed to read. You can see all the words they got correct. You can see the words they substituted for other words. And you can see where, uh, for example, rocket and rocket ship. Rocket. Um, you can see where they inserted words. Uh, and you can see um, some other information like uh, these gray boxes indicate when a child paused or hesitated. And uh, also you can see when a child repeated themselves. So we have Fonzie, Yat and Yog, and then... Yat and Yog. So um, this is, these are insertions. These are words that weren't there, but it's very interesting to note that they are exactly the same as the words that preceded it. If you were a teacher and sitting down and doing this, you would notice that the child repeated itself. So this is more, this is less an error type and more of a behavior. And this is something that uh, we have built as a product feature within our Fluency Engine, specifically because of Brenda's knowledge of these educational projects and uh, products and the children's behavior when they're actually reading. So maybe Brenda, maybe you tell us a little bit more about um, self-corrections, about repetitions and other kinds of behavior. Right. Thanks, Amelia. Um, hi, everybody. So I think, as Amelia said at the top there, it's a fantastic example of a typical child reading. This is a child whose decoding skills have built up. They're going into fluent reading. The automaticity is coming into play. And uh, she's even adding that lovely bit of uh, 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 feeling into it. Oh, no. And it's almost feels like uh, two waves crashing together here with this child. Um, so it, it almost feels like her enthusiasm is tripping her up a little bit. And uh, there are really common mistakes and errors that a child will make when they're really trying to put that level of emotion and feeling into what they're reading. And so we see things like uh, repetitions. We see things like there's a couple of omissions here and there, but it's really the insertions where the child has gone back to either place find or do a little self-correction. And we know that these are all typical behaviours. And if you consider how hard it is for the speech engine to manage this, here's the text the child needs to read and then the child does, this is typical ch children's behaviour. So they go off script, they add, they delete, they uh, repeat and um, that can be quite a difficult thing for uh, speech technology to follow. But this, this soapbox speech engine does it beautifully and it does it really well because of the amount of data that um, Amelia's team have put into the system and the level of accuracy that we've built into it all over the years. So as Amelia said, a teacher can get huge amounts of actionable data without having to sit through and do this level of markup. Additionally, we know a teacher will sit quite often sit and write an SC on top for self-correction. They may mark an insertion. It's a lot to do whilst listening to a child, either in an observed situation or in a situation where you're listening back to a file. So having this automated is incredible. And somebody asked earlier um, a bit about and the kind of words that you might be able to report on. So ones that are, um, you know, maybe decodable words, other words that are not typically spelled, etc. cetera. Um, so in that case, you can decide what you do with the data. In the same way, if you want to check for self-corrections, you can look for self-corrections. That data is coming up in our next release now this month. So as a subset of an insertion, you can have a repetition or a self-correction. Again, they're typically not counted as errors, they're counted as behaviours. Why are they important? They're important because if a child is self-correcting a lot, they're may, they're, they're, that level of automaticity that needs to be happening isn't happening. They may be struggling with decoding certain words. And you could start to use that data to deliver that really important actionable insights to teachers. Um, 
as to what may be going on with particular children or a particular group of children at a classroom. So the teacher's not just getting time back, they're getting information. It's not just data, that data can be turned into really useful information for a teacher to see there's a group of children who may need one kind of intervention or I need to do a whole class intervention on something. So um, I went a little bit off piece there, Amelia, but with regards to self-corrections, yeah, it's a subcategory of insertion. It's coming soon and we're really excited about it because it's something that teachers are really, really interested in. It's a sign, um, going back to what Shelley said earlier, you know, the child should be able to recognize, decode and comprehend. When a child is comprehending and paying attention to what they're reading, they will self-correct. So whilst it's a kind of an error, it's a really good sign that the child is catching those errors and self-correcting. So teachers, it's really useful information for a teacher to see that becoming a pattern in the child's reading and then going down again as the child improves on their, their fluency. That's Just awesome. while we have a small pause there, Amelia, maybe uh, we have a question that came in um, around, could, could we actually show the um, JSON tab in the demo, just so you can ah, kind of show what's well, behind the, we'll the file, so maybe you could do that now, yeah. Yeah, I was actually just going to do that because uh, you might be wondering how you integrate the Soapbox product with an educational platform like that of Imagine Learning. And uh, when I flick over to this tab here, it becomes a little more apparent. So um, if you want to integrate with the Soapbox engine, all you need to do is send an audio file and the associated text file or a reference to the text file to the Soapbox engine using a HTTP request. And what we send you back is this JSON file. So any coders in the audience might um, recognize the structure of this. It's very automatically easy to parse. Um, you can see the audio duration. We've got things like the language co code and uh, the time that it hit our server, the server ID and the latency. We also have the um, information, the linguistic information, the analysis information. So we have the reference text that I typed in and we have the transcription that came out of the recognizer. So um, then we need to compare them. So, I mean, the reason that we built Soapbox Fluency is um, because we realized that for child speech recognition, the transcription, this field here on its own, just it isn't useful enough for many of the applications that you need speech recognition for. It's only one of the data points that we return. So, and you know, you can see this here, you can see how we've lifted the information here, like alignment type correct. That's the field that allows our developers to color in this word space, space with uh, in white with the blue box. We've written a rule that says if the alignment type is correct, that's how we surface it and that's how we visualize it. Um, for each word, we also have, you can see the confidence score. You can see a start and an end time for each individual word, for each phoneme or speech sound that makes up that word. You can also see the start time and the end time. So if you want to flying play one word back or a section of the audio file back, you can lift these data points out of this JSON and say play from this start to this end. And then you can use that information to do all kinds of cool things in your own product or platform. So um, there's a lot of information here and it's very hard to read. So um, if I flick back to the summary, I can show you some of the decisions that our engineers made for the purposes of displaying. And one of them is to count up all the insertions, omissions, substitutions, et cetera, and put them here and collate them together. So we actually return this in the in the JSON up at the top, I think. Yeah, correct count, deletion count, insertion count. And they all go there. Um, but what we don't return is words correct per minute, because like Shelley explained and Brenda explained, there are certain ways, depending on the situation, that you may want to calculate that yourself. Um, so that really is everything that we return for now but we do have some wonderful product features on the way. And one of them, of course, um, which isn't pictured here is to indicate when a word is a self-correction. Another thing we'll be introducing soon is information on expressiveness or prosody or in intonation. So if a child is reading and they're reading in a monotone, it might be an indication that they are con concentrating very hard on the words in order, but not actually doing auto automatically enough to allow their natural cadence of their language to seep into their, their expressive reading. 
Um, by tracking the pitch rising and falling over the sentences, you can get a very good indication of how um, fluent a child is at reading, um, given how expressively they read. You can also use information about the pauses in between words to get an idea of that as well. And like all our data points, we aren't making any kind of judgment on this. What we're doing is giving you raw data that you can then parse in whatever way you want and surface that information in whatever way is useful to you. So um, as Shelley said, they are using certain data points within Imagine Learning and they're looking to use more. And we will keep, keep providing the ones that we feel are most useful. Brenda um, liaises very regularly with all our clients to talk through what's important to them, what certain uh, interpretations they have of certain data points are and what might be useful for them. And one thing that came out of that actually, and I can display it here, um, in a way, you might notice that the child, when they were asked to read that, they got as far as Fonzie goes left before they ran out of time. There, were, there was more text on the page. Now, when you look at the amount of omissions, you can see that there were 19. But if you look at the markup, you can see that most of those omissions occurred at the end of the paragraph. And this is because the child ran out of time. And this is another thing that you as a... Um, Ed education platform provider might decide that it is unfair to say that the child had 19 omissions. You might say the child ran out of time and therefore they only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven omissions. And that's what you want to return. Now it can be um, engineering wise a bit annoying to have to go back and count them all individually for every file or write a script that would do that. So what we've actually done as a product feature is allow you to put in a flag that says you want to an indication of the last word that was heard or read. So actually, Brenda, maybe you could explain it a bit better than me. I think you've done a great job as always. Uh, yeah, so exactly that. There are a couple of different variations that the customer can choose on how they want to interpret the, the rule. But uh, essentially, last word read is the one that we default to. So where did the child stop reading? So as you quite rightly pointed out, there are 12 deletions uh, that happen at the end of the passage that the child um, didn't read. And this is one that we used for testing. This was one of our use case files that we used for testing. And in this case, um, it has a difference of 16% in the accuracy measure. And it obviously impacts on the words correct per minute also. So, um, and I know um, that Shelley and her group would imagine we're one of the Lighthouse customers on this. We always have a Lighthouse customer when we're working through a new feature. And uh, we typically talk to um, at least five customers when we're looking at a new feature. And uh, our customers are super with us. They feed into what looks right, what feels right, what's going to be useful to the teacher. And so we validate that as we go through before release. And this was one of the things that we've been working through and uh, is also ready to be released now. So it will help to improve accuracy. It will not penalize a child for reading a little slower and not getting to the end of a text. Typically, what we find is that most of our partners provide a text that's way longer than they expect the child to read, just in case. And also, sometimes they allow the child to finish reading that story, but cut off the audio recording at one minute. So you don't really know where the child is going to finish. So this is this is an incredibly helpful thing for ensuring that the student gets the correct score. Great. Thanks, Brenda. Um, I suppose the only other thing I should say, uh, going back to the underlying technology that allows the Soapbox Fluency to work is accurate, accurate speech technology. And at Soapbox, we've been working on this problem even before we release Soapbox Fluency. The on, the, there's years of R&D that has gone into the underlying technology. Um, this fluency uh, product and any fluency product will only be as good as the underlying technology. And at Soapbox, we make sure that we're building something that works in all environments for all children's voices. Um, we have um, built our models on um, a very, very large amount of data of children in different environments, in real world environments from almost every country in the world. We've hundreds of thousands of individual speakers in our database. And when we build our models, we make sure that we have 
the correct proportions that make the most equitable model possible. And that means that when we um, are testing children from different regions in the world with different backgrounds and from different age groups, that we're making sure our technology can work equally well in all of those. And we also have a lot of information about children's speech patterns and reading patterns. And we leverage that knowledge to do curated language modeling or um, system tuning for each individual client so that you can be sure that when a child reads a passage like this, if they read it correctly, our system will be able to transcribe, transcribe it very, very accurately, I'd say almost perfectly. And if a child goes off script, it will also be able to accurately transcribe what the child says because of the knowledge we have of the different types of mistakes children make, the different systematic and um, semantically similar mistakes that children make. And all that knowledge goes into our modeling and into the system and the technology that underpins these products. Um, so um, really uh, that's all I have to showcase you, except to say maybe that I think we have a product fact sheet about Soapbox Fluency um, being released soon. So uh, maybe, uh, Martin might have a little bit more information on that at the end. And um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer all your questions if anybody has any particular questions. Great, thanks, Amelia. So I might get you to stop sharing uh, just for now. We have a few questions in, um, let me just change the view. There we go. Um, so the first one I see was for Shelley. It was around whether or not, um, Fluent Reader Plus is available as a single license um, for somebody to use in the home. So I don't know if that's. So imagine possible. learning interfaces with educational institutions, right? Our customer base is school districts, schools, states. We don't sell directly to consumers. A lot of that has to do with privacy and data security concerns around the data that is generated by the students and the agreements that we have to have place in place with our customers. We don't currently offer a direct to consumer license for natural language and literacy. Okay, great. Um, so let me just go down the list of questions here. So um, first one, probably for you, Amelia, is um, how does the background noise in the audio files affect the analysis of the file? So we, um, I mentioned our um, proprietary database that we use to build our models. And one of the things that set us apart from the very beginning, from the very early days, is that all of this data is real world. None of it is um, headset mics in a very quiet room and a soundproof room recordings like uh, uh, some of the old speech systems would have been based on only that kind of data. What we did is we made sure that our data came from different uh, devices, tablets, um, mobile phones, laptops, in noisy environments, in kitchens, classrooms, all these different um, places where children frequently hang out and use technology. Um, so we wanted to capture real behavior, real speech, real atmosphere and background noise. And all our models are built in that kind of speech. So that means that our system is very robust in these kind of environments. That's what we mean when we say we've built it for kids from the ground up. It means that every decision we made about adding data to our models has been with the view to where is a child going to use this? Is it going to make a robust enough system? So for that reason, our system is very, very robust to normal noises. Um, there's a lot of noise cancellation done by um, mics now and in mobile phones and in laptops. So, you know, that that has come on a lot in its own right over the years. Um, but Soapbox um, works well in a classroom. It works well when there's kids reading in their own tablets all over the classroom. And, um, you know, unless you have something that is drowning out the sound, if the signal to noise ratio is uh, very, very low, then that, that that's obviously very hard to discern speech from, from noise, but um, we do target a testing of this in-house. We have our da data set and then we can infuse it with different noise levels. And um, we can see that over different noise levels, our system remains robust. Okay, great. I'm gonna try and take these in sort of a logical order as opposed to the order came in because some of them are related. So this one is related, which is, um, can two students record a body read at the same time into the same audio files? In other words, alternating sentences, then have soapbox differentiate between the two speakers. Um, Amelia, I'm guessing that one is also for you. 
Sure, yeah. So we're kind of looking at speaker diarization to a certain extent here. You'd have uh, to the, the system would need to, to not necessarily identify the children, but just recognize that the two voices come from two separate people and return some kind of indication of that happening. So behind the scenes and soapbox, we do a lot of classification work. And some of this way will in the future make it into product. So I think we'll have more exciting things to say about that in a few months time. Great. OK, and this one is sort of, I think, for, for both Shelley and Amelia. So it's around specific models for different dialects and accents. I know, Shelley, in your pilot, um, there are a lot of kids who were emergent bilingual. So, you know, one of the things you were keen to do in the pilot was make sure that the technology works for different accents and dialects. So maybe you'd speak to that first of all, and then I'll get Amelia to answer on the, the sort of soapbox side of accents and dialects. Yeah, so at Imagine Learning with language and literacy especially, one of our um, main use cases is for English language learning students. So we have large populations in southern states in the United States. Um, we have large populations where there are large refugee populations and students can get onto Imagine Language and Literacy and begin to immediately learn English. Uh, they're hearing instructional audio in their native language and they're practicing English. So we knew that those students would be encountering Fluent Reader Plus. We have not yet looked directly at like the data set specifically around the students with the accents. Um, because again, the, the pilot that we ran was mostly around, do we believe that, that the value that we will provide to our educators by taking away the need for them to do the audio evaluations on their own? do we believe that that value is is worth pushing forward with this product into into our our whole customer base so that's something that i would expect us to listen to but in speaking with the educators who were in our pilot group they you know they they weren't we weren't hearing that it wasn't working with their students who have accented english so we're very confident that this that the engine works we're very confident that it is able to parse english spoken with a dialect and we're really excited to look deeper at what the data is telling us in in a future study thanks shelly and maybe immediately just talk a little uh, briefly because we've seven minutes left to move a few more questions to get through so um maybe yeah, just talk brief, briefly right. about accent <laughs> about accents and dialects please sure sure just to reiterate what i was saying about the database and all the different speakers we have all of those speakers are from different parts of the world all of those speakers speak with different accents and dialects from all over the us and beyond from britain from ireland from uh, india from australia uh, from south africa from every country we have Different amounts of data, sure, depending on the availability. But when we select for a model, we make sure that we've covered all the accent groups and then we double check that we are uh, performing equally well for all the different accent groups that we can. So we do specific targeted testing for that as well. Um, our system works really, really well for all accents. And also we go one step further. We look at different vocabulary that occurs in different dialects. We have that in our dictionary and in our models so that our system is able to actually recognize those particular words and phrases when they're spoken. Is that brief, Martin? Very good, Amelia. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I have a question here from Jean Megan, um, who says some very nice things about the presentation, but also talking a little bit about the level of categorization on errors, emissions, etc. Um, are there also plans to capture or analyze the prosodic components of fluency, e.g. stretch, uh, sorry, stre stress, pitch, and phrasing? Very easy for me to say. <laughs> Um, hi, Jean. Uh, thanks for the lovely comments. And uh, yes, we are working on prosodic elements. We are working on um, pitch. So returning pitch readings all along the audio file um, corresponding to, to the, the speech in it, obviously. Um, we, are, we already return information about hesitations 
um, so you can see if there's you know a lot of hesitations or, or pauses in between words you can then as a you know provider of, of an ed tech tool see if that relates somewhat to um, the punctuation in the text for example and that will give you information then against about the phrasing and again it's a good indication if a child is reading fluently but um, I think Brenda maybe you might have something more to say about that get to my unmute button uh, yeah no I think you captured it there I mean the main uh we're releasing our Prosody version one and again we did a lot of work with Lighthouse customers on this to make sure that we were looking at the right things that we were measuring things in a way that made sense to our partners and to teachers so at pitch as you say and looking at how pitch and the cadence of that might work with um certain punctuation etc as it goes through either spoken or uh, written language and then also, as you said, phrasing, um, how, how is the phrasing sounding? And we've made it, what we've done is we've made it a little easier to measure uh, pauses and hesitations in, uh, in, in reading so that it's easier then for the customer to parse that information back and make some sense of it for the teacher. And it's an interesting one because we're trying to put a scientific value on something that's quite intuitive. And that makes it difficult, but we really believe we've cracked it with the help of our partners and also difficult for a teacher to be doing all that markup, doing a running record and gauging uh, the prosody also. It tends to be quite an intuitive thing. So it is adding a level of, um, uh, of scientific value to that as well, which I think is great. OK, right. So um, we really are on the clock now. So three minutes left. So brief, brief answers for these ones. So th this is about confidence levels. So what confidence level is a word considered substitution and can that be altered? And also related to that, is the confidence score connected to a threshold and is that threshold adjustable? So those two are connected to each other. Okay, so um, the confidence score uh, related to a threshold. So we are, all the data points we surface up are completely agnostic. So when we say something is 72%, that could mean that for a particular student, that is very, very good. For another particular student, the teacher might decide that that is a poor attempt. So really, the only people who know what the scores really mean in that exact moment are the teacher and the student. Um, but, uh, you know, all other things being equal, we can always give thresholds of anything above 70 is most likely very good. Anything below 30 is most likely not what they were supposed to say, or maybe some speech wasn't actually there in the file at all. Um, when it comes to the substitution and how uh, substitution is classified, basically this gets into the inner workings of the speech recognizer <laughs> itself. So it isn't necessarily related to, it is kind of related to the confidence, confidence score that comes back, yeah, but uh, under the hood, the recognizer has decided that the most likely word in its arsenal that it could return to you is this one. And if that doesn't match what the child was supposed to say, it, that means that it was a substitution. This can get a bit tricky when we're thinking about self-corrections, like if the child says um, a partial word like ca cat or something like that, which one you know, was cat just a different word or was it an attempt at the word cat? And we, we have a lot of research and work done on that. And we think we, we've really kind of nailed it with our, our self-corrections feature release that's coming out soon. Great. OK, uh, I'm going to answer this one because about data privacy. So where are the audio files processed? Well, it depends on where the client needs them to be processed. So they can be processed in the EU if GDPR is the issue or they can be processed in the US if we're working on the US uh, data privacy uh, legislation and all data sent to soapboxes anonymized and de-identified. So that's how we deal with the confidentiality and the privacy aspects. I think I'm just going to keep this for the last one. So it's actually for you, Shelley. Um, have, how have you seen this kind of fluency assessment be nuanced to maintain a low affective filter for second language learners? So in Imagine Language and Literacy, students are recording themselves from the very beginning. There's lots of different activities in which they have the opportunity to sing a song or repeat a word or a phrase. And they don't actually hit these fluent reader activities until they have been either in the program for some time or they started the program and they were already um, somewhat, you know, they were already to that point. But once they get to fluent reader activities, like I said in my presentation, the student experience is not changed at all for them. So they know they're being recorded and they know that they, part of their instructional audio is that this is 
this will be sent to your teacher, but they hear that a lot. And so because they're so familiar with the experience of being recorded and knowing that their teachers are going to get their recordings, also when the teacher awards that in-game currency, the next time they log in, they get a little message that says, your teacher gave you currency, gave you booster bits, good job. So they know this is happening. So we haven't necessarily noticed and we wouldn't expect to see any change in student behavior simply because their audio recording is going to be audio automatically evaluated. They don't know that's going to happen. And it's not a new experience for them. OK, what a great way to finish. Um, please join me. I think uh, I don't know what the appropriate uh, way to thank people on Zoom is you, like a virtual clap hands or something. Um, thank you to everybody on the on the um, on the call. Thank you to Amelia and Shelley and Brenda for presenting. Thank you all for attending. Uh, a link will be going out with a recording of this webinar. If we didn't get to your question or if you have a follow up question, then please contact us at hello at soapboxlabs.com. And we look forward to seeing you all again on our next webinar. Thank you very much, everybody.